Hi everyone, thank you for watching this video. In this video I'll talk about George Orwell, his novels, philosophy and shortcomings in 10 lessons. This is a very brief introduction to George Orwell as an author, his world views, his criticism and his own weaknesses. George Orwell was born in India in 1903, but he grew up in England and went to Eton College, the most prestigious school in England. He worked as a police in Burma for five years and later he wrote his masterpiece, 1984, about a police state. In 1920s and 30s he lived among the homeless and the working class and even in war zone in Spain to gain wisdom and insight to fuel his writing. In 1945 he wrote Animal Farm about a revolution gone wrong. In 1948, when on the verge of his death, he wrote his last novel, 1984, to warn us about totalitarianism. He died in 1950 at the age of 46. Today he is considered as one of the most famous writers in English language. Animal Farm and 1984 are read in schools and universities in the Anglophone world. These 10 lessons sum up Orwell's writing, views, insights, shortcomings, but also give you a deeper understanding of his works and philosophy. Lesson 1. Embrace your contradictions. Orwell was a socialist and then he was not. He was a nationalist, then he was also internationalist. He was anti-colonialism but also defended the British Empire. Today people on the right use him to attack the left and the left use him to attack the right. Even the CIA used his books in its propaganda campaign against the USSR. That is some irony. Orwell was a maverick. His views shifted as the world shifted around him in those tumultuous periods of history. I think that's the case with most of us. As we navigate through life, we change so our views, feelings and beliefs. In 1984, Orwell talks about doublethink, a belief that two contradictory things could be correct at the same time, which Orwell himself criticizes as being wrong. Dostoevsky taught us that we hold two opposing forces inside us, good and evil, according to Taoism, yin and yang, dark and light, whatever you name it. In 1984, the world is run by people believing in one single truth. A single truth is perhaps the most dangerous thing humans have invented. Too many human atrocities are committed in the name of single truth. Human emotion is very capricious indeed, as Mr. Christopher Hitchens, Orwell's greatest protege, might say. We are indeed capricious, contradictory creatures. Best to accept and find ways to deal with it, instead of denying it. So believing to be right all the time is a form of dogma. We are sometimes right, sometimes good, but not all the time. Lesson 2. To become extraordinary, one must tell the truth. Orwell spent years among the homeless and the poor to understand the deeper truth. He liked the working poor, but also showed his frustration with them in Animal Farm. For example, most animals slowly forget the revolution and just get on with life. Orwell didn't like this passivity. At some point he had to accept that socialist revolutions don't solve the problems but create newer problems. He risked his career in telling what he considered to be truth. To find out things, to discover things, one must transgress, go in the wrong directions and take treacherous paths. Emile Zola, the French socialist novelist, risked his career to stand up against lies and deceptions when a Jewish officer was wrongly accused by the French army to have had betrayed his country. Orwell too wasn't afraid to jeopardize his career, social status or membership to a club. We live in a world where people are told never expose their weaknesses. To be a winner is to hide things, overlook corruptions and hypocrisy. The case against the WikiLeaks founder is a good example. Most big newspapers didn't dare talk about him in case it might jeopardize their circulation or get more government scrutiny. Telling the truth has become more and more risky things to do these days. So to be extraordinary, you have to tell the truth, even if it risks your job. Lesson 3. No insight without discomfort. In 1927, Orwell lived rough among the homeless in Paris and London for months to understand life gain new insights about the homeless and become a better writer. He admired Jack London, the American author, for writing about the poor. Orwell didn't like the intellectuals and their pompous attitudes towards the poor. 
Dostoevsky didn't like the Russian intellectuals. He found them to be out of touch with reality. After months of living in terrible conditions, Orwell wrote Down and Out in Paris and London in 1933, one of the most profound books on homelessness. He repeated the same experience in 1936, this time about the working poor. He published The Road to Wigan Pier. Then he went to Spain to fight against the fascists, which he recounted in his book Homage to Catalonia. No pain, no gain is such a cliché, but in Orwell's case, he purposefully sought discomfort so he could write better. Lesson 4. Revolutions or Acts of Revenge In his short novel Animal Farm, which I think is Orwell's best work, animals rebel against human farmer Mr. Jones and take over the farm with the slogan that all animals are equal. But a dispute between two leaders lead to one being killed. The new leader slowly adapts Mr. Jones's mannerisms and gradually acts like a human. There's a new slogan, all animals are equal but some animals are more equal. At the end the animals can't recognize between the leader of the revolution and old human oppressor. Most revolutions are acts of revenge, not liberation. To give you a couple of examples, the French Revolution invented the guillotine. The Russian Revolution invented gulags. According to the historian Yuval Harari in his book Sapiens, even national independence doesn't liberate people, simply replaces foreign rulers with local ones. For instance, he mentions the Indian national independence in 1947 didn't change the lives of the ordinary Indians. Under the India's national government, business continued as usual. Poor remain poor and rich got richer. So revolutions are change of guards, a dress rehearsal, so far as ordinary people are concerned. Animal Farm teaches us that revolutions tend to only benefit a handful of people. Lesson 5. Coercion is also invisible. In 1948, when Orwell was ill, he finished writing his last novel, 1984, about a police state with a total control over its citizens and their thoughts. The main theme of 1984 is control of information. Not only what is said or not said, but what is taught or not taught. For example, if you watch big media companies like CNN, BBC, Al Jazeera or Russia Today, you notice they cover certain stories. This selectivity may not be a problem for one day, a week or even a year, but over time it skews your thinking, it shapes your views. You are coerced in a certain direction, which Chomsky called manufacturing consensus. Julian Assange published some horrific war crimes in Iraq. As a result, he has lived in confinement for 10 years. He didn't kill anyone, merely exposed those who committed war crimes. No big newspapers came to his support. None of those media companies fought for his freedom. Telling the truth is as dangerous than killing people. Why? Because it disrupts the main narrative of government or state and controlling information. If you control information, you are able to control people better. Parents do this, governments do this, and corporations do this. Even individuals do this to keep a nice image of themselves. Soft coercion also includes advertising and influencer culture that diverts attention from bigger truth to smaller celebrity scandals. The royal family scandal was a load of nonsense that the media kept talking for weeks. The end result is that we are beaten and tired. We are so beaten that we limit our news consumption to certain topics. Now with online news, it allows us to create our own filters that we only get news about a specific topic such as sports or culture. We are so bombarded and coerced enough that we have learned to narrow the funnel for ourselves because we are overwhelmed and tired of sheer volume of nonsense. Lesson 6. Conflict gives humans a purpose. In 1984, the world is divided between three nation states and they are in perpetual conflict with one another. In history, every nation is born as a result of conflict with another nation or empire. In this channel, I have read several national epics. In all of them, another nation is depicted as enemy. For nations to survive or thrive, they need an enemy, just as fire needs oxygen. Why all politicians hate immigrants? Twin elections. Tribes, nations or empires in essence are totalitarian, based on irrational motivations like hatreds of others. 
Studies have shown that individuals tend to be rational when faced with someone they disagree. But a small disagreement between two groups turn into hatred very quickly. Groups are formed on the basis of fear of others. The best way to unite people is conflict, based on race, gender, religious, ideological views, or even veganism. For individuals too, a fight or a struggle motivates us and gives our life meaning. At times of peace we invent new conflicts, religious, ethnic, or something else. After World War II, football hooliganism took over Europe. Now it's mostly online hatred. Conflict motivates us. Nihilism and suicide are very high among peaceful societies. Is there a way out? Enlightenment humanists or rationalists offer a solution to solve conflict with rational discussion. But this has created a dynamic that lawyers or intellectuals have become so skilled at logic that they can rationalize pretty much anything. Buddhists resolve conflict by getting rid of competition or success itself. The more you desire, the more you want to fight with others. The less you desire, the less you desire. I personally think that it's a belief in one single truth or the pursuit of a single truth that causes all conflict because it presupposes that the others are wrong. Orwell doesn't offer any answer, so it's best to understand and accept that conflict motivates us to do things that we might not otherwise do but also accept that we shouldn't always fight to win. Lesson 7. Obedience is a human trait. In 1984, the government controls people, their thoughts and their actions. This is not surprising. Anyone in position of power wants to keep it. Parents, bosses, regimes and gods. What's surprising is how obedient and docile the people become after a while. Orwell fought for the working class, but later saw them as a bunch of obedient bastards. Coercion happens for a reason, to control you of course. Obedience? Well, it's a survival instinct. Keeping our head low means we live another day. Any nail that sticks out gets uh, promoted or made king? No, they get hammered. So what is the point of rebellion? In 1984, Orwell's characters, I mean Orwell himself, knew what happened to the animals in Animal Farm. Slowly the new revolutionaries became the kings and life went on as before for most animals. What was the point of all the sacrifices? The novel 1984 is dark, bleak, like Blindness by José Saramago, which I discussed here a while back. Some people don't see the point of revolution or national independence because their lives won't get better. Kazuo Ishiguro writes about people who put up with shit to live and do their best to survive. So for him the heroic is not in changing the world but putting up with it. In Orwell's 1984, Winston Churchill, sorry I meant Winston Smith, the most boring character in literature, manages to have sex with his girlfriend to defy the state. So if you live in a police state, if you have sex with your partner, you are a revolutionary. And some of us can't even manage that. Obedience also works together with peer pressure or crowd mentality. Perhaps we have genes that tell us to follow the crowd or give in to the pressure of those around us. Peer pressure or crowd mentality works like gravity. It is an invisible force that shapes our behavior, but we don't even notice it. Lesson 8. Be opportunistic to get noticed. Orwell wrote Animal Farm at the beginning of Cold War, a perfect timing. With Hitler gone, the West had a new enemy, another man with a mustache, Mr. Stalin. Orwell, clever enough to see the opportunity, he wrote Animal Farm in a way that anyone without any imagination can see it was the Soviet Union. Lenin and Stalin as two pigs, Snowball and Napoleon. Snowball, I mean Lenin, dies soon after the revolution, and Napoleon, I mean Stalin turns the Soviet state into a machine. Socialism as animalism. A farm as a country. Animal Farm made Orwell an immediate champion of West against the Soviet bloc. The CIA translated Animal Farm into Russian and sent to the USSR as propaganda. European colonial powers used the Bible against their colonies. Orwell enjoyed this very much, as he followed it with another book, much darker, much gloomier novel, 1984, that there was nothing good about socialism. One can say that he was trying to redeem his years as a socialist. 
and to make it more clear on his deathbed, Orwell asked for a proper Christian burial. Just remember that he was an atheist throughout his life. The man was repentant. The circle was complete. A radical socialist turned into anti-socialist. This reminds me of someone else. Dostoevsky's protagonist in Crime and Punishment believes in revolution and wants to change the world. But by the end of the novel, he returns to the Bible for some comfort. In no way I'm suggesting Orwell is similar to Raskolnikov, a murderer, but I think it has to do with age. The closer we get to old age and death, the closer we feel some kind of religious comfort that tells us a more comforting story that death is not the end, that there's another world, a promise of a better place. In the next lesson, I'll discuss this religious return in relation to his dystopian views and his novel 1984. Today, he's claimed by both the right and the left to attack each other. Orwell was smart enough to see which way the wind of history was blowing. He leaned that way. Lesson 9. Future is bleak. 1984 is one of the bleakest novels in English language. Orwell was a product of the British Empire, born in India, worked as a police officer in Burma and worked for the BBC during the war. Orwell saw the most powerful empire falling and blamed the selfish Gandhi for that. In his essay on Gandhi, you can see how much he hates the man. This was repeated by Hitchens in his attack on the Albanian nun, Mother Teresa. I think both Orwell and Hitchens were trying to show that nobody is sacred, nobody is beyond criticism, nobody is no matter how much they are revered. Why? Because humans, no matter how good, still has all the human flaws, no matter who they are, Gandhi or anyone else. At the time of Orwell's writing, the center of global power was no longer Britain, but America to the west and Russia to the east. The British Empire, who had enjoyed 200 years of being number one, was dying. But Orwell too was dying when he wrote 1984. Future was bleak dystopia for a man who grew up in one of the most formidable empires. Did it predict the future? Yes, in many ways. Some say Aldous Huxley, who coincidentally was Orwell's teacher, both teacher and student had the same dystopian vision, who in his novel Brave New World predicted a dystopian world based on corporate organizations finding more effective technologies and medicine to control society, not the governments. Yes, through technology and medicine. I think it's safe to say that technology is developed and used more effectively by private corporations, and governments tend to buy them or play a catch-up. Medicine too is in the hands of private corporations, but its use in controlling the population is less obvious. But when it comes to digital technology, he was spot on. I mean Huxley. Today, we volunteer our information to Apple, Amazon, Google, and they know more about us than we know ourselves. Governments aren't as smart as corporations when it comes to surveillance. In 1984, Orwell wanted to tell us we are doomed as a species. Carl Jung might say Orwell was merely telling a Christian story that future is bad because the Garden of Eden was the best we had. In no period of human history, humans have truly been free. Some people, yes, the kings, the generals, and the elites, but the majority of people slave their lives for the entire human history. It's likely this will continue. Are we worse off than Orwell's time? In some ways, yes, but in many ways, no. Were people better off in 1500s? Some, yes, but most people not. No good comes without the bad, and no bad comes without the good. Orwell, despite having the great insight into human psyche, still saw the world in a black and white terms. Ironically, Britain has one of the highest number of CCTVs in the world, making it the most police state in the world. But it's not as bad as Orwell had predicted, I think. I hope. Lesson 10. He failed to turn political writing into art. Orwell was a product of European Enlightenment, just like Karl Marx. Both were rationalists and their approach that you shouldn't just interpret the world but change history as part of European Humanist or Enlightenment project to make the world a rational and mature place for everyone. One of the biggest flaws of Marxism was and still is that they don't understand art. Russian architecture before and after 1917 revolution are vastly different. Soviet buildings are functional but ugly. Marxists saw art 
a bourgeoisie culture. It is true, but it doesn't mean it's bad. Orwell said, all art is propaganda. Orwell failed to appreciate art for its own sake. 1984 is one of the driest novels you will ever read. Great theme, great idea, and great insights, but the storytelling is lacking. 1984 looks like a Soviet building, pretty boring. Orwell was a rationalist, so he didn't respect human passion or emotion that creates artistic expressions. A rationalist approach is like a brutalist architecture, strong, brutal, but not pleasing to the eyes. So despite his brilliance as a political analyst and sociologist, he failed to tell a good story in 1984, failed to make an emotional impact like a great art does. An Italian film called Life is Beautiful is about a father and son during World War II. Very dark, very gloomy, but the story, especially the ending, is so powerful that leaves you in tears and speechless. Art can be so much more powerful than any political epic. Another example recently I read is Men in the Sun by Palestinian author Kassan Kanafani, which I reviewed here. It doesn't talk politics, but it tells some story. Another characteristic of socialist writing is that they don't care about the individual because they see society through the lens of the collective, class. Orwell's characters are impersonal, soulless, therefore less memorable. I should also point out that Orwell was sick when he was writing 1984. Animal Farm is by far his best work. It's clever, it's witty, and it's fun to read. Orwell told the truth. He stood for his beliefs until his belief was shaken by reality. Then he questioned his belief. His political novels resonate with young people because they understand that there is a lot of bullshit behind the clean facade of modern nation states. Those in power are far more sinister than they might appear. It's a game of control and normalization. Now here's a thought experiment. If we all lived in prison all our lives, would we be able to recognize it as a prison? 